All right, thank you guys for being here. Obviously, uh, looking back on Saturday's game, found a way to win, and it's always hard to win on the road, and it's always hard to win a conference game. So we found a way. Um, obviously, a lot to learn from, good and bad. And um, we, we've watched the film, put it to bed, and understand what we have ahead of us in SMU. Um, the accolades, I don't know how many hours we got because there's a long list of them for what SMU is. They're top 10 in the country in scoring offense. They're top 10 in the country in scoring defense. Uh, they're sixth in the country in sacks. They're undefeated in this conference. Uh, they are playing at extremely high level. I believe all their conference win are by uh, averaging of 30 plus points. Um, they've got a very, very, very talented team, but so do we. I'm really excited about the challenge ahead for us. Uh, Saturday morning at 11 a.m. in Simmons Bank Liberty Stadium for a blackout. I know our fans are going to show up and be loud and proud and, and just excited to uh, have the opportunity to play at home in a huge game. We understand that not only it's important, but it's the next one. But uh, look, we know this game means a lot uh, for what we want to try to get to as a program. Yeah, well, I was going to ask the, the conference championship implications. How are you guys handling that in the locker room? Are you approaching that, or are you just kind of just staying away from that conversation? The whole it's the next game. Uh, our guys know. I mean, they're they're excited to be at home. You have you, you win last Saturday to give yourself a chance for this Saturday's game to be really important. And I don't need to paint the picture. You know, we like I said, even a month ago, right? Like the goal is the championship game, right? To, to win a championship. Um, but we've really narrowed our focus on being one zero every week. And so our guys, they get it and they understand. Um, guess what? This game's just important. And then. If we win this one, the next one's as important as any we play, and no different than the previous Saturday. So our guys have had great focus on just, hey, let's improve ourselves and uh, find a way to prepare for SMU. I mean, how do you evaluate the defense? On one end, they've allowed a lot of points. Uh, you are, you're on the other hand, in the fourth quarter, they've made some key stops to help you guys win the game. And so how do you kind of evaluate both of the sides? Sure, you know, you, you look at the plan, you look at the personnel, you look at everything. Um, we got great defensive coaches. We got great defensive players. Um, is our what we've done defensively um, perfect? No. Are there room for perfect? Absolutely. You know, and it, it, our coaching staff starts with me, um, and then the co defense coaches know we've got to be better, and the players know we've got to be better. And so, um, there's certain things you see. Anytime you go into a game, you get four takeaways. I mean, that's outstanding. Regardless of how many points you give up, you get four takeaways. You're going to win most games. You know, even if you're giving up a thousand yards, you get four takeaways, give yourself a chance. Um, you, know, you get those critical third and fourth down stops at, at key moments. And so they're, they're making the plays and finding a way when it matters most. And th ultimately, right, you get a pick six. No, well, no one, when you look at the final score, all you just think, of, oh, yeah, that was a, oh, wait, by the way, the defense got that score. Um, our, I talked about our kickoff coverage team, how poor it was, and putting our defense in, in bad situations um, where, you know, the drive starts for Charlotte were, you know, at the 50-yard line or plus. And, um, look, there's things our defense can clean up for sure, and they are, and they're working hard on it. Um, but at the end of the day, finding ways to get the stops when it matters most uh, will always be as critical. Um, I, I do study statistics. I do look at what's occurring. Um, but, you know, sometimes when it's all said and done, getting takeaways and being able to get the critical stops are as crucial as anything we do. Ron, you said those lines, do you, do you go back, third down conversion, you're – really good. Uh, turnovers, as you just said, you're really good. But but basically, yielding so much yardage, is that a mentality thing here or schematic, uh, play calling? Uh, you know, I think a lot of the yielded yardage was missed tackles. We had 17 missed tackles in the Charlotte game. And whether it's a one-on-one -on -one tackle or a guy's not flying the ball, the effort's there. I don't think anybody has once watched a Memphis football game, you know, in the last our last 10 games and said, wow, that, those guys don't play hard. I think most people, uh, your guys play really hard. And that's what that's one thing that you can, because if you don't have that, man, we're, we've got a long ways to go. So they're playing hard. I think some of the missed tackles is where we're seeing some of that stuff. There's always going to be, right, how can we adjust scheme, right? How can we uh, put this guy in a better position? So it, it well, like a lot of things, it's a combination. Um, you know, the, we do preach the takeaways a lot. We do preach third downs. and. Um, and, and finding different ways. So, um, but we work on base downs just as much as anything, right? You never want to give up a ton of yards, but if, if you're keeping them out of the end zone, if you're finding different ways, um, those are things to hang your hat on. It's over the years, and you and I talked about this on the television show, like the evolution of football, like more and more teams are being more aggressive. So it's even harder to be a, a defensive coach. Um, 
you know, everybody, you know, well, let's just shut them all out. Well, that's easy. That sounds nice. Yeah. But I think, you know, and a lot of that has to come with just finding different ways and guys stepping up. Uh, but when it, when you, you circle back to what's the main focus for us and where we've been poor lately is the missed tackles. Ryan, finish was the word of the summer, and obviously it's one thing to say it, but you guys have actually been doing it. It has come to life for you as a coach. How, I guess, gratifying is that to see? Yeah, I mean, look, as a, as a coach, that's one of those things you sit there and you, you try to get the message across to your, your team, your organization. Um, I think, right, you hear whether it's the CEO of FedEx, Amazon, AutoZone, whatever it may be, right, you always want this is our message, this is our culture, and it's only as good as if everybody's bought into it. And I think, and again, I even mentioned this in the press conference post game, like I don't like to look at last year's and compare, but like, we didn't finish games last year, right? Let's talk about Houston, East Carolina, different opportunities, and then this year, finding the ways. Um, and so it's it's unique how that happens, and it's I think the guys are bought into it, right? The ebbs and flows of college football games, the ups and downs that occur, you sit there and you're okay. Find a way to finish, no matter what it looks like, whether you're, you're up 18 or down 18, finding ways. And uh, that's gratifying, because I think the buy-in is there. And, in any organization, any college football program, um, no matter where you're at, to get 100% buy-in, it's impossible. But I think we got the majority of our guys, the majority of the people in this program, um, from the janitor to the, the grad assistants to the uh, coordinators to the third string long snapper to the starting quarterback, I think they're bought into the way we do things. And that's key, and, and you gotta push it every day. And that's when, when you talk about all those things, that's when you start talking about culture. And I think right now it's at a really strong point, and the belief is there, and that's why we're able to find ways to finish. On Saturday, you had uh, Xavier Hill playing another position on the offensive line. Is that a situation with the guy where you know he can do all those things, or you kind of figured that out as you see? Yeah, not one of those things. You, I, I didn't go in. Uh, Jordan's like, okay, let's have him start at right tackle, then move to left guard, and then wake up and, and move into left tackle. Uh, he's what gives him that ability is he's smart, and uh, he he's. You know, has a full understanding of what we're trying to do offensively and as an offensive lineman. Um, it is one of those things we have a little bit of trial by error. I'll be honest, it's not like he got a ton of left tackle reps um, this offseason or even this season. Um, so credit to him. You know, I, I didn't give enough credit to a guy like Mitch Gildehouse, who, um, like I said, had been getting backup center reps and then went and got the, the nod at left guard. Um, you know, and then moving those guys around. And that's, it's, it's always sounds easy, but like if you go from right side and your body, your muscle memory is used to blocking this side, and then all of a sudden you got to flip everything, your weight balance. And for a guy like he's Avery Hill that went from the starting right tackle at the beginning of the season to starting left tackle um, in a game that was of crucial importance uh, is huge and credit to him. So um, a little bit of learning as we go. We try to move those guys around, but you're limited in reps. So uh, really, really proud of his effort. Is there a the last couple of weeks you it seems like there's been kind of random guys pop up for the opponents that have, that have done well against y'all, whether it be two to three quarterbacks for UAB, whether it be a running back who had four yards all year yeah. going off against, with Charlotte. Is there a level of kind of comfort in knowing that SMU is really good at what they do, but you know what they do? Like you have a very clear – like these are their guys. This is what they do. We've seen the tape. We know what to expect. And and, and the, the honest answer on that is, we felt the same about all the opponents. And then all of a sudden, like I, no, we talked about last week, like didn't prepare for the four quarterbacks at UAB. And so, um, I I think that's a credit to the Memphis program is that teams are trying different things versus us because, yeah, you, know, you go in, you talk to the Charlotte coach before the game. Hey, this this is our Super Bowl. We've got to win this one. And and, and, and so. That's refreshing to hear that, hey, we circled this game on the calendar. You hear that from a lot of teams um, when they play us, which is a great thing. That's what you want. And so, um, yes, SM, here's the deal. SMU does a lot of things really well. And, uh, you know, I wish you could just be limited and say, okay, hey, here's what we're getting. Um, they do a lot of things really well. And so I, I assume what we see on tape is what we're going to see, especially later in the year. But, look, they had the extra day to prepare. Um, Scott Simons, their defense coordinator, was actually a linebacker's coach on our staff a handful of years ago. So have that relationship with him and um, just, you know, know the different things they can do. So they're, they're going to obviously strategize and, and put together a game plan themselves. We've got to be prepared for it. But um, we assume, like a lot of these coaches, that, okay, this is what they've done time and time again, that that's the majority of what we'll see. But 
uh, will have some tricks up their sleeves. Uh, we will have some tricks up our sleeves, as I'm sure they'll have some changes and challenges as well. Coach, with this being the final regular season game between y'all and SMU, how much has this rivalry meant to the program for motivation, and what is y'all's strategy to make sure the Tigers get the last laugh of this rivalry? Yeah, it's been fun. You know, I've enjoyed being part of this. As you guys know, I always appreciate uh, the history of, of Memphis Tiger football, and you know, now going on my eight, you know, finishing up my eighth season here, um, it's been fun that that game, that back and forth. We recruit that the Dallas area, the Greater Fort Worth area, um, heavily. So a lot of battles in recruiting, and then on the field. And my memories will always take me back. A lot of people always say, "What's one of your favorite memories at Memphis?" and you know, obviously the college game day and being able to run out and see that crowd, it's, you know, I got a picture at my office, we have it in the facility, and you just think about what that meant to the city um, and to the really, you know, putting this program, continue to keep them at a high national level on the map. And so that's what I always think about this, a lot of back and forths, um, and they've always had a good program. And, uh, you know, I, look, wish them well in their next conference. Uh, we'd like to send them out um, with a loss, and, and that's our job to pair this right the right way this week in order to have success on Saturday. Going back, going back to um, injury reports, depth charts, obviously this has come up a couple times this season. Would you be in favor of like the conference instituting injury reports for every team? Yeah, Jonah, that's a great question because I've even been, not to get off track, but like people even ask, hey, what about the helmet to ear communication piece, which we've talked about, you know, on the TV show we've talked about different, like, I think at some point we all got to sit down and say, okay, what's next for college football? Right, whether it's a conference or is it in general, like is it injury reports and who manages it? How are they going to manage it? If they are, that's great. Let's be all across the board because inevitably, right, we're going to play play Florida State next year. Well, if the ACC has different rules than the AAC, and and Mike Norvell and I are playing a cat and mouse game, then like what are we really doing? No different than the, you know, the helmet uh, communication with the walkie talkies for play calling from the to the safeties or to the quarterbacks. Like, I'm great with that stuff, but. How's it going to be uniformed? How's it going to be policed? No different than the tablets. And so um, I do, we sit back, I, I would love to have some uniformity in all of it. Um, we always, college football is always chasing the NFL model, right? And then high school is chasing the college, but like there's also 32 teams in the NFL and you're talking about a $16 billion industry, right? And it's easier to kind of enforce all that stuff here. Um, so. Uh, I'm all for it. How will it get done? I don't know. If the conference has great ideas, great. I, I believe in my best of my ability without it being a competitive advantage or disadvantage to be open with you guys. Like I said to you last week, like I, you guys, that y'all are doing your jobs and I'm grateful for you guys being out here every week and, and yeah, you guys making the trip to Charlotte, like that's your livelihood. So let, let me try to be pretty open with you on some stuff. Um, and I wish other coaches were because I think it's just beneficial not only to their fans, to the media, uh, to the people writing the stories, trying to tell what's going on within the program. So. Uh, the more transparency, the better. Uh, I'm all for it, as long as it doesn't put a player in harm's way or it's not a advantage or disadvantage one way or the other. I didn't catch your entire post game press conference, so I'm sorry if you answered this already. Um, there were a lot of fans wondering about the double pass when you guys had the momentum in the fourth quarter, especially with Seth's injured shoulder. Yeah. Uh, I know you're not the play caller. Is that one you would like to have back? Well, first off, you need to be watching. I cannot believe you haven't watched the press conference. So, I caught a couple minutes of it. Yeah, well, I got a lot going on. I'm sorry, you're busy, but uh, <laughs> I'll make time. We'll show it after the TV show. But uh, that you know, it's a great question. And regardless, like I'll never whether Tim Cramsey, Matt Barnes, Chris White, like uh, every decision ultimately falls on me. So like if it's a bad play call, you know, if we drop a pass, blame me. Um, here's the deal. It, situational football we, we've seen some things on tape where like man this could be a strike up the band for the Memphis Tigers if this works um, reality like we had run it, it was a very similar type of concept earlier in the season had my guy rock we, rock did exactly what he was supposed to be caught and just ran north and south probably would have gotten 12 yards in the first down I don't blame him right if I'm 20 years old you tell me I get a double pass in a game well uh, yeah had we executed the blocking properly if you pause it and go back I don't ever watch television copies obviously I watch the um, sideline end zone views had we executed properly it probably would have been a touchdown um, yes with Seth shoulders but he was comfortable um, and, and catching it wasn't any of that stuff uh, we'll never want to put him out further harm's way we also talked about the play and how it probably would have been open 
Um, any plays that don't work, yes, I'd like to have back. So that could have been the same for the inside zone call that got tackled for two-yard loss or the, uh, you know, an interception thrown on a, you know, so all those things, but yeah. You're all for two with that play, though, or is it still on the table? Uh, let's, well, I don't want to give it away to SMU. So no, yeah, we're, we'll probably open the game with that one. So um, if they could be prepared, uh, yeah, no, we'll, uh, it's, it's like a lot of things, right? You, you see things throughout the week and you try to take advantage and then you see it in the game. You say, okay, this has an opportunity to be an explosive play. Um, there's, right, throughout my career for 25 years of coaching, there's, I got a laundry list of plays we'd like to have back just like anybody else and just like decisions we've made in our lives, so. I have a question for you about Seth. You mentioned after the game, you didn't really practice until Friday. Um, how dicey was it? Like, how close was it to him not playing? And then what is the process? How did he come out of that game? What's the process like for him this week? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, first off, we know Seth's really tough. And he, had it been a, a, a freshman quarterback, quarterback that hadn't had the experience, you, you, no way you're putting a guy like that in the head in practice because um, you can see what happens. And, I, and I, look, here's the deal. I won't use it. He won't use an excuse, nor will we as a program. But, like, same similar situation in Tulane. Like, he goes, you know, where he was banged up, and he's like, I'm going to play. Um, that, obviously, that was coming off a of bye, so there's limited information out there for the media to know that, like, Seth wasn't able to practice much prior to that game, and then same with this one. Um, and, I, I, and I tell him, I'm not, we're not putting you in the game unless I can see you go full speed on a Friday. You know, Thursdays are a walkthrough day, so, right, Mark, you could be out there throwing. We'd say, you look good, you know. <laughs> um, but you know, he, what he showcased on Friday was, like, one, he's healthy enough. And, we, and again, I always refer to our medical specialist to make sure we'll never put a young man in harm's way. But he's obviously has a firm understanding um, and intelligence of what we're trying to do. He paid attention. I mean, he was, even when he wasn't practicing, he was back there, you could – Paying to uh, even not, maybe not getting the physical movements, but dialed in mentally, and um, you know, once he was able to go on Friday, he's like, I, "I'm going. Let's let's do this." Did he come out okay? I mean, look, yeah. Going? So first off, I did think like we did start a little rusty on some of the stuff. I mean, the opening drive I believe was a 14-play touchdown drive for say a, a defense that had done pretty well statistically in Charlotte, um, and then you know some some missed throws here or there. I mean, if you look, I think we missed four deep pass explosive that you could say, well, sure. But I mean, arguably, had we had the right touch on it or one way or the other, they could have been so. Um, but I think as the game went on, in, spe in fact, I believe it was, Joan, did you ask after the game or somebody, you know, once he got knocked out and then came back, not knocked out, once he came out and then came back and he seemed to play better, was that something like, that's a battle, uh, that's a warrior mentality, uh, you know, which is pretty unique um, that, that a young man at that age at 20 years old. But all that being said, uh, feel comfortable with I, I, he'll be a full participant in practice this week um, hopefully there's not an or on the depth chart but maybe we'll just keep it there and, and then just in general this yeah, I mean you guys are eight and two you won four in a row do you still feel like you have something to prove to people the rest of my life yeah, yeah the rest of my life um, it's that's that that's what I appreciate about this group that's why I appreciate about the staff and that's what that's who I am I mean I got something, you know, I don't care if you're undefeated, you're always something to prove. And I think that's anytime you lose that edge, you, then shame on us. Um, so our guys are, look, they were, you know, people can say all they want. Yeah, the, we expected a different result in Charlotte. Shh, everybody, right? You always expect to go out there and, and hit your business. But opening drive, 14 play touchdown, and that, the ebbs and flows, it's, and I don't want to refer to other programs or anything, but. Oklahoma State was a 15th ranked team in the country. They go play on the road to a team that had won one conference win and lose by 42 points. 15th team in the country. And, and Oklahoma State, they've got a head coach that's done it year after year after year. And so you just talk about hard as the win. And so I mentioned that post game, like it's really difficult. So we're, we've got a lot to prove, right? Regardless of what happened Saturday, regardless of what happens the following Friday after that, I mean, um, and that edge, and as long as I'm the head coach here, this program will have that, that, that hunger, that mentality to continue to go out and prove and fight. And however it looks, right? Like I said, they're never going to apologize for wins. And um, eight and two, look on paper, you know, reality people would say, hey, you're doing good. You're doing well. Uh, sure, not really. Like, that's not good enough. Let's find ways. And, and, and credit to the teams we played, credit to. You know, Tulane, who's a, a top 25 team, credit to Mizzou, who's a top 25 team. I mean, we see, see what Mizzou does every single week. 
and more and more people are like, man, aren't, aren't you excited to see that score? I don't, I'm, we beat Charlotte, cool. Now I've got to focus on SMU, so. Um, are we doing some good things? Sure. And most of the time when we, we sit here, it's like, let's, let's talk about all the, there's so many great things that are occurring in this program, so I'm pleased with that, but uh, there's certainly room for improvement. Yeah, so going back to, yeah, uh, as you were running in, going back. <laughs> well, you don't have to answer it, No, you're good. Well, Frank had asked that, yeah, we're truly just talking. Our players understand the importance, but I'm not, yeah, we talked about the championship. But, and I even mentioned, I think, part of it once, you know, after that two-lane game, like, let's just focus on one week at a time. And our guys have really bought into doing that, and I think that that will help us. Um, I've, I said all the time to you guys, like, about having the blinders on, so they know what the implications are they they have we all do will the lead up to that two lane game kind of help you in the lead up to this one and that there was you know there was a lot of hype from what happened uh, maybe games. and i you know and i think I, we, so all week i won't even talk about a championship all week i won't even talk about i'll just go do what champions do go practice like you know um to be one and oh today and win the day um it, it was fun this morning i woke up not woke up i was what few hours after I woke up but while they were waking up early this morning a bunch of the players on a group text with me and it was like you know when the day attack you know b1-0 and that's just that messaging that's awesome from the, to them to say it and I think that focus is going to be huge and so um you know sounds corny let's have our best Monday we've ever had hey <laughs> let's go out there tomorrow you know let's have our best Tuesday and then these are all dress rehearsals hopefully so we can go out and, and, and play a really clean uh, Memphis Tiger football game on Saturday morning. Ryan, these close games, um, being down against North Texas with less than a minute, being down 10 against Charlotte, how does getting out of those situations prepare you for what may come against SMU or whoever else? I think that's so throughout the season, right, we've seen it a variety of different ways up in games, down in games, battling through, having a big lead early in the season and being able to keep it, you know, all those things that occur in a football you hope you're, you're just kind of building your story and you learn from those, the, the good and the bad. Like, okay, hey, this is, but it also allows our guys to have a, um, a not a comfort, but a confidence. And okay, we get up now, we, we've learned hopefully how to maintain a lead. We've, uh, we get behind and there's no panic. I don't think, it, you know, you, you watch in college football, you see teams panicking on the sideline, coaches losing. Um, you guys have asked all the time, like you look over like, how do you, you and Seth just stay like that? Because regardless, even if you're up 21 or down 21, find a way, play the next play. Um, and so you learn from that. And I think that's part of uh, credit to the young men in that locker room with the maturity uh, and the growth that they've been able to see. Would you agree it's, it's easier to not panic when you have all those experiences in, in, in the background? <laughs> yeah, I can't say that the uh, my, my uh, stomach isn't hurting and that my pulse isn't racing. I don't show that publicly during those games but yes for the players i mean they, they've they've been so great they're steadfast in their mindset and their approach during those games that yes past experiences good and bad right you, you try to take from them and, and put them into wherever you are in a current situation no different than practices right like hey we practice this august 14th i know you guys don't remember it but i do and, and oh yeah the, the old man's right let's now go put it into play and uh i think that's kind of, of fun to be able to see those things I'd rather not have them always be so stressful. The more we can learn from our experiences in the games and in practices, the better off we'll be. Ryan, what do you see specifically from the SMU offense? <laughs> They're the 24th fastest pace offense in college football. Um, and it's like, well, what's the, the, very similar to South Florida in their pace at times. And now South Florida's <clears throat> number three, but not a whole lot of difference between um, their quarterback. Um, he makes it go. He is special. I think he was the highest rated quarterback in SMU history, you know, uh, four or five star. I mean, he can run, he can move, he can throw. Um, you know, he was biding his time in order to now be the starting quarterback there. Um, they've got a lot of uh, weapons and wide receivers. I know they used a lot of NIL money to bring in a bunch of different guys um, to, to, to really go. Their offensive line is much improved from last year. They've got a rotation of four or five running backs they use, um, guys that were uh, very talented. And so and they find ways to get their tight ends the ball. And so it's a, they do a lot of different things, right? They're not just going to throw it up all over you. They're going to try to uh, run it. They're going to try, I mean, and the quarterback, he'll beat you. If all of a sudden you go and got a clean shot on the first sack, he'll 
make one miss, roll out of pocket, and then throw a shot down the field. Next thing you know, it's a 60-yard pass. Um, so we've got to play really, really clean on defense. Um, it's, there's a reason they're top 10 in the country in scoring. Um, and they do that, and what they've added this year is now they're top 10 in the country in defense. Um, and it's a recipe. There's a reason why I think someone showed me or sent me yesterday that the, there's only the only other teams that are top 10 in both offense and defense are Georgia, Michigan, and I think I don't know if Penn State's still there anymore. But it, you know, you're, now you're talking about Michigan and Georgia and SMU. It's like, um, and that's a team that's played Oklahoma. That's a team that's played TCU and then is undefeated in conference play and. Winning those games by a, a large margin is what SMU's been able to do um, in a lot of their conference games. Ron, is uh, Demir doing all right, and is there any chance he plays this week? Yeah, great question. So Demir um, is doing very well. Thank you for asking. In fact, uh, in the locker room, he was he was great. Uh, doctors actually cleared him in the locker room. We, we always go back with a follow-up of anything of that significance. Um, we feel, as long as the doctors clear him, that he will be um, – safe and, and no further risk of injury to, to proceed and hopefully play uh, this weekend. Looking at the, the rest of some other injury questions on the offensive line, Condors and Gamble, is there any update on it? Not to keep you guys in the dark, truly day to day. Um, and so hopefully we'll have, I, I don't, hopefully it's not one of those Seth yells like, I'll let you know for Saturday morning uh, for Tiger Walk if they're walking with us. Um, we're going to see what they're capable of doing this week and if they can go, they will. Um, but I, I John, I truly, I'm not sure until we get out there because, you know, Sunday night's really a, truly just a modified get out there. And, and um, so we'll, we'll see. Hopefully they can, we'll see what they're able to do tomorrow. If they can, they will play. And then right. just one other one, Brandon Thomas, same question. Obviously, he's been such a big part of the game. Yeah, it's the exact same situation with Brandon. Like, um, in fact, we met as a staff this morning. We kind of go through the injury report, and, and his is a, uh, a day to day, you know, we kind of. We have got the guy. We have not ruled him out yet, and we have not said he's full go. So it's kind of uh, limited to see where he is. Ryan, with that being said about the SMU offense, do you feel like your defense has to put up a performance of the season in order to come out of there with a win? Well, I think we're seeing a lot of uh, explosive offenses. I think our defense has to continue to step up. Uh, if they go get four takeaways, I think we'll like the results when uh, when clock strikes zero. But um, our defense knows that this is a very potent offense. Um, our defense knows the challenges that are when they've got talent all over the field as an offense, not, hey, we just got to hone in on this one guy or we've got to stop this. Um, when it's multifaceted and multi-talented, uh, they've got to bring their A game. Um, and so certainly it's going to fall on everybody, right? We've got to be better on special teams, got to be better on offense. But um, our defense understands the test that's ahead. Uh, they've got to have a great week of practice. They've got to have a great week of film study. Uh, to get go out there and give ourselves a chance, but I, I think they'll be ready. What is SMU's team speed like on both sides of the ball? Uh, it's um, we've got a lot of talented teams in this conference. You'd be hard to argue that uh, SMU doesn't already look like they belong in the ACC with some of the speed, with some of those things. I mean, um, some of their comps, but, but their skill sets and size, um, very similar to Missouri, uh, with what they're able to do. And uh, it's, uh, I mean, they, they can run, and they've, they've, they've added to their roster significantly, and they make no bones about it. Hey, this is what we've done. Um, you know, they used to be a team from just from Texas and the Dallas area, right, never recruiting outside their two-hour window. And I mean, they got m more guys from Florida than you know, maybe Central Florida, you know. And so um, they've done a nice job adding to their roster, and, and they're playing at a high level. That's right. Okay. Thank you, guys.